Hey music fans and musicians, uh, this is Ari Koinuma for AriKoinuma.com and today I wanted to share with you my thoughts on why we listen to all 10 minutes of Achilles' Last Stand by Led Zeppelin. And the reason I thought about this is because I write long songs and I write it and arrange it so that 10 minutes go by fast, I hope. Uh, that it's really interesting to listen to the whole song and not like make it a dr long drawn out thing that you just kind of have to sit through, right? Uh, and then I realized that that's something that I have in common. I'm not saying that I'm quite at their level, but I have something in common with Led Zeppelin when they go on these long epic journeys with some of their songs. So I thought, hey, I want to see what they do to make their songs interesting and, and listenable for the extended duration. Alright, let me play you a bit of the opening arpeggio and go into the main riff. It goes something like this. So it starts out in E minor, yeah, mysterious sad chord, and then it goes into F sharp minor. So it's like a two minor chord, sad and sad, and that's actually uh, not exactly in a, a usual way to start a song. The song is overall in E minor tonality, right? So then to have it with another minor chord is unusual. And then after that he goes into main riff, it goes... Right? That sounds like, whoa, a little exotic sound, and if you listen to it, it's the same F sharp minor chord. So F sharp minor to E minor, right? So this is a an example of modal harmony in that um, in the key of E minor, there's not usually this F sharp, uh, or C sharp, actually. Um, so that is a Dorian mode, E Dorian mode, and that uh, he probably just wasn't thinking like, oh, that's a Dorian or something. He just was fooling around and came up with two parallel chords, and he was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. So I'm gonna build a song around that. And um, so that's one thing that we can take away from is that when you have a interesting sound, you can build a song around it, and that often comes from something that is not exactly in the key that you're in it's just something that is doesn't really belong there but you just kind of fit it in and then that creates the sonic signature or harmonic signature of the song that really sort of defines the sound right uh, f sharp minor to e minor is a fairly sort of weak sounding progression so he goes into he ends that with a D chord, which is in the key of E minor. D is, uh, you know, flat seventh. It's uh, what I call defiant chord, and then it adds the oomph and the power that um, is really needed in this progression. All right, so that's like the main riff, and then of course Jimmy Page has a bunch of different sort of guitar parts that come and go, but underneath his playing, the rhythm section is doing something completely different. And the layering that is going on, or you could call it orchestration of different parts, is really what uh, sets this song apart, and it's another the home hallmark of uh, Jimmy Page's songwriting and arranging. Well, I shouldn't say Jimmy Page, the whole band, the Led Zeppelin, right? So while Jimmy Page is doing this and then all that, uh, there is a uh, uh, different bass line that is going. And that dotted rhythm that John Paul Jones is, is playing um, is actually not really mirrored by John Bonham's drum parts either. I mean, that dotted rhythm is that... You know, that's, that's the thing that really adds urgency to this uh, main part. But uh, it's a completely independent part. It's not really mirrored by anything else. And then, of course, John Bonham is just... I mean, it's tour de force, right? It's just amazing drummer, and just this is his fine showcase how monstrous his just groove is and all that. Uh, 
But anyway, the point remains is the drums and bass and guitar are doing three different things at any given moment. And when you listen to a lot of rock music, uh, riff-based rock music, a lot of times you might be listening to like two layers at most, like the guitar and bass is playing the same riff together and probably the drums are playing something that just really kind of holds it together or is just going along with it and then maybe the melody is the only other layer that is happening. So two or three layers but here um, Led Zeppelin has four different layers and that gives the song the richness that in my mind that is what we listen to and what what makes us come back to you or what makes us listen for a long time because there's more depth uh, richness to listen to whereas if there were less few fewer layers and if they were more sort of a um, easy to understand right away then you get tired of it faster Alright, so on top of those instrumental parts, uh, Robert Plant comes on and he sings a melody that kind of goes something like this, right? So the, no, the thing that you notice about that melody is actually about how not exactly strong of a melody it is. It's not a kind of thing that you listen to it by itself and you really mem remember it. But considering that how the rest of the band, especially the rhythm section, is just galloping along full throttle really fast. Uh, the guitar lays back somewhat uh, during the verses. But uh, this is a very contrasting kind of element that Robert Plant is adding. Notice how most of the moves are uh, you know it's just downward in motion. Downward motion uh, or, or lines have sort of a uh, settling down effect. It doesn't really build energy, it just kind of deflates it a little bit and then most of the notes move in stepwise motions so there's no surprises, there's no big gaps that creates drama in the melody to and call it attention. So again, the point is that music doesn't all have to be everybody playing the same kind of thing. You orchestration happens by you throwing different pieces that do something possibly different. And that is actually harder to make it work. Something like this could have really fallen apart and not really made cohesive sense. But when it works, it gives the music just so much more to listen to. Um, and that's part of the strength of Led Zeppelin's catalog and their approach. And that's something where you can't really separate the arrangement from the songwriting, that the things kind of go together and you can't really sort of picture the song in any other way. And that is part of their style that really has had a enduring appeal. Okay, so moving along, after going through that verse several times, he goes into this pounding section. Uh, it goes something like this. And the reason why, in addition to it being a distinct rhythm, why it really st sticks out as really gnarly part is because of this F chord. So all along we've been hearing this F sharp minor. That's kind of pretty. Uh, and then e, e minor, right? And then all of a sudden you hear this. That's only half step above the E minor chord, and it doesn't it doesn't have the C sharp or the F sharp that's in the F F. F sharp minor chord it goes that has the F and the C and that half step difference is what creates the tension in that part and it has a contrasting sound to it and that creates part of the drama of the song is that you you know par particular tonality or particular harmony on one section and it just all of a sudden there's a twist right and then moving on from that, one of the interesting things about the song is that there's really no discernible chorus to it, right? And instead you get this ascending riff, it goes something like... Uh, 
And again, the tonality changes. This is actually the home key of E minor. It goes... There's the C natural, not the C sharp. It's a natural minor, so the D is not a minor there, and there's no um, F chord here. It's the F sharp. So again, he went from this E Dorian harmony to uh, something that has a F thrown in that's just really dissonant, and then now he's going to more sort of a um, uh, open sounding E natural minor harmony or scale. And so in a song, it's just, he's just going from the same E minor uh, home bass, but three different twists, and then that is. Um, Again, his approach to songwriting and to, to make different parts more distinct and interesting. Alright, other than those three parts, the only other distinct part that he has in this song is this pounding riff. It goes... Something like that. And it has a very distinct pounding riff. And, you know, with the galloping main part and then the pounding middle riff with the F chord in it and to this, this pounding, there's a bit of a rhythmic variety and change of tempo. And that's how Led Zeppelin is creating a drama and making each part distinct so that you listen to 10 minutes of it. That being said, I would say, as a songwriter, when I listen to it, I'm like, the song doesn't have a chorus. So it just kind of has a really sprawling feel to it. And after a while the, the variations that, that that Jimmy Page creates with especially on top of the verse part, uh, he has all kinds of different guitar parts that come and go, but still it's the same harmony or tonality, so you just kinda of go, hmm you know, it doesn't create, create in, quite enough contrast to really sort of keep it going. So in my opinion, that's my theory I have of why this song works and why we are drawn to it and, and, and as musicians in particular we just marvel at it is because first and foremost we have John Bonham on drums and when you have John Bonham on drums you can have, I mean this is a perfectly great material to throw at him but even a mediocre material, you have John Bonham sitting on the drums and he makes it sound everything great. And I've always theorized, or it's my, my observation, that drummer is like the most important piece in a rock band and that the drummer has the ability to either make the whole band sound come together and the whole band big and grooving or everything falls apart. It all comes down to how great the drummer is. And when you have John Bonham, you don't have to try very hard <laughs> to make a great sounding music. And so at this point in Led Serpent's career, they've had plenty of successes already. The, the Stairway to Heaven and Cashmere have already happened. Um, I think Jimmy Page ha could afford the luxury to get, you know, just be a bit, a bit on the indulgent side. I'm not saying this is not a good song, it is, but I think it, it doesn't have to be quite as long as it is and it can stand to be as long as it is mostly because John Bonham is anchoring the drums and with lesser drummers it just doesn't really hold interest for this long. And so that, in a way, when I, I came to that conclusion I'm like, well, you know, that's something the rest of us can't really hope for ourselves in terms of our music making. But the point remains in terms of how when the rhythm is strong, then the song is strong. And when you build in layers into the song's arrangements and not have everybody play the same thing all the time, then it stands to be listened longer and more, you know, with more repetitions and you come back to it because the song just stays interesting because of that depth that the layer creates. So, thank you again for watching. That's it for today. I hope uh, you got something out of this and that the next time you listen to this song, you think of something new or you notice something that you haven't noticed before. 
If you have any questions or comments, let me know and I'll respond. And also, I really appreciate it if you can check out my music as well. All right, I'll see you next time. Thanks.